All right, so thank you for coming, everyone. Um, today, my presentation is called Power to the Individual, and I want to talk a little bit about secession movements of the past and some of the failures of them, and uh, recognizing the failures of them so we don't repeat those, and uh, also looking to the different dynamics of secession movements throughout uh, recent history, mostly within this country and within this continent, um, but also around the world. Um, so the secession, uh, as not many things I could say good about like uh, the Libertarian Party in terms of like their effectiveness or princi uh, like the principled message necessarily, like sometimes they go a little off track. But uh, during their foundation, they had a very good secession platform um, in which they said secession should be recognized and respected as long as three conditions are met. Um, in the state seceding, there is a majority support for that secession. Um, the majority support is not in any way uh, oppressing against the dissenting opinions. And um, that the new state that's being established would be more compatible with freedom than the previous uh, than the previous established state, and that is an important thing to focus on. That uh, when a secession is happening, it should, as libertarians and anarchists, be opposed if it's going to create in some way a more oppressive state or more restrictions on individual freedom. Because um, not all secession movements are based on freedom and based on granting people. More um, so there are numerous metrics we could use as far as what is a success for a secession movement. Um, gaining complete independence and sovereignty and uh, control of the political system of that area is one metric. Um, but there are other metrics of success in terms of just preventing uh, something going on that one doesn't want going on in that area. For example, the Conk Republic, uh, like the, the Keys in Florida, they did not establish political sovereignty. They're still a part of the United States. Um, but through the protest movement of establishing the Conk Republic, they were successful in actually preventing uh, U.S. Border Patrol checkpoints from being uh, utilized there. So they kind of drove out by uh, doing like a mock secession, they were able to gain some rights for their people to travel. Um, most acknowledged, uh, we have to acknowledge the failures of like bad secession movements. And sometimes here in the United States, there's an attempt to glorify or lionize different secession movements, um, primarily and most notably the Confederacy in the United States, when in fact, like that was not a pro-liberty movement by any stretch of the imagination. It was a specifically white supremacist slaver movement. Um, and I understand that there is a large historical push by many people whose grandparents and you know relatives may have been involved in those movements to kind of whitewash it, pun intended, um, like what really the, the whole thing was about. But if you actually read their words, if you look at the documents of the people who were seceding, they said this is about slavery. Every single state that seceded specifically enumerated slavery as the reason. Um, so we shouldn't put on blinders to that and pretend it wasn't about slavery when, through their own words, it was. Um, Alexander Stevens, who was the vice president of the Confederacy, uh, gave a pretty famous oration known as the Cornerstone Speech, where he lays out that this nation was founded upon the principles of white supremacy over the other races, uh, founded upon the principles that slavery is their natural state, and um, he says that the failure of the United States upon its founding was that even though they had slavery, it was not incorporated enough into the founding of their nation, and because of that, that's why there's strife, and that the Confederacy would solve that strife by putting these lesser races in their place. So these are things that they don't necessarily uh, explicitly go over in school, but that was is why there is so much resistance when some people see the Confederacy thing is not just someone's heritage, someone's grandfather fought, but yes, this is uh, an existential threat to human liberty, and this idea that you know one group can be uh, dominant over another group. So uh, that's why I say it's important for, uh, if we want our New Hampshire se uh, secession movement to be successful, we should not be associated with secession movements that are based upon the idea of whitewashing or glossing over uh, human enslavement uh, when that was a cornerstone part of other secession movements. Um, the, we're often given the narrative of the Civil War in the United States as being it was fought to end slavery. In the, it was more fought to preserve, uh, to preserve that captive tax base that the South was. Um, they, the North didn't want to lose that revenue. Um, they didn't like that it was about slavery, but if you go to Lincoln's own words, he says, if I could preserve the Union without ending slavery, I would. So 
even though uh, the Civil War became a war about ending slavery and the narrative shifted over time as it became unpopular, um, it did not begin about ending slavery. It was something that was kind of morphed into because the moral push for maintaining the tax base wasn't strong enough to inspire people to walk voluntarily into a hail of bullets. Um, so there, there is a need for, uh, if we want succession, secession to be successful, um, we need to obviously not have those same failures as in the past, um, and we also need to be united with people who would otherwise not support secession for other reasons. Um, in that sense, it's good to be like culturally in tune with the areas of where people are, are wanting to secede. Um, many failures have lacked popular support. For example, uh, two areas of Texas, the Republic of Rio Grande and the Republic of Yucatan, seceded from Mexico in the 1840s. It didn't last long, it only lasted about five years, and then they rejoined with Mexico. Um, so that's obviously not, if, if the idea is for the secession to be successful, then you wouldn't want to just rejoin the, the empire shortly after leaving because, you know, ec economic issues or whatever. Like, so those are things that we want to have foresight into. Um, an example of an, a secession movement that one could be skeptical of based on its benefits, like uh, Brexit, it's one I have less familiarity with, but my understanding is that many of the reasons for the exit had to do with immigration controls, travel controls, and also uh, a tax system based on farming subsidies. The, the UK was paying into this European farming subsidies and they weren't really benefiting from it. Um, ending the farming subsidies is great, but in terms of Brexit being based on the idea that the UK is now going to impose harder controls for travel and immigration, well, that's not granting liberty to people. That's actually restricting freedom of movement. Um, so in that sense, that's a, a secession that while there may be good principles about it, it definitely infringes on people's uh, freedoms. Um, the Schengen Zone in Europe is one thing that's almost akin to the American free travel among uh, the states, in which members of the European Union are able to supposedly travel without border checkpoints, without any uh, sorts of identities between the other member states. Um, if you think of it and how that's akin to the United States, it's a freedom that we have that people seem to understand domestically. They understand that someone from California can travel to New Hampshire and they shouldn't be bothered for that. You know, unless they're getting on a plane, then they, they might get the full molestation. Um, but as far as the, the principle of travel being allowed, it's something that as technology has made it easier, as means of travel have made it easier, restrictions have gotten greater and there really hasn't been a resistance to those restrictions by and large. It's just been something that's rather accepted. Um, Aside from people that are actually smuggling or actually uh, just openly violating or clandestinely violating these laws, um, we all become subject to them. Um, the Articles of Confederation in the United States established a sort of free travel into the, uh, and sort of like a the idea of a borderless nation. Um, it said that in the when the Constitution was written, there was actually nothing written about uh, the right of the government to control travel. The only right placed upon, or ability given to the government to control travel was in the event of invasions. And invasion is a specific military thing. It's not just a bunch of people looking for work, as uh, some, some news commentary people like to phrase it. Um, so maintaining that is important, but we see it eroding all the time. Biological threats are, of course, a concern. And uh, a wartime threat is, of course, a concern. The whole passport system, of course, comes from wartime, but when the war ended, for some reason, this, this right was never reestablished. It was just left behind with the war, that now we have to always identify ourselves when we're traveling, even though we're going between free countries, not at war with each other, uh, with no reason to be restricted. Um, New Hampshire is in a unique place, being in a border region, since we, we share a border with another country. Um, there, there is something very naturally stateless about border regions. They're areas where neither uh, other countries that are meeting really have control. And that's something that, uh, that sort of culture is something that is very anarchist in nature and uh, something that should be cherished and why we should sort of restrict the idea of any sorts of border impositions here in New Hampshire, be it the ice on the highways or even more militarization of our actual in the sand border with Canada. Um, other border area secession movements that, uh, that are kind of significant, um, 
Well, actually, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the Canadian and U.S. border. If you've ever been to Derby Line, Vermont, and Sandstead, Canada, that town in Canada is a rather successful, prosperous town with shops and places to get lunch and all that good stuff. But if you go to Derby Line, Vermont, it's rather desolate. There's empty storefronts, there's abandoned houses, and there are ICE agents roaming all over the place. And obviously this is a place that has a lot of United States immigration enforcement. And you can see how that killed the town, it killed the area economically, culturally, um, when the idea of these border towns is something that it has a rich cultural, it's like a, a great place of cultural sharing where you have two nations uh, having very shared values in this, an area. Um, so in that sense it would be nice if our New Hampshire movement, it's not just secession movement, just New Hampshire liberty movement in general, did more to concentrate on uh, building more ties on those border areas so that the people that uh, are right across the area politically from us also have the, the support for what we're doing. Um, Another place where the, the border region is utilized by a secession movement, if we look to the Zapatistas in Mexico, um, the reason they have so much autonomy has a lot to do with the fact that the area they're in is so difficult to control for a government. They're in the mountains, they're in the jungles. Um, they're, in a, they're in a place where, since it's so difficult for the state to control, people are able to be much more in control. Um, and to a large extent, the, the human rights element of their movement is something that they've put at the forefront and I think that's something that uh, here in New Hampshire and other movements we could definitely learn from in terms of keeping themselves safe by making the global awareness of their human rights issues more pr uh, pronounced and making also in turn the Mexican army more hesitant to want to take action against them for fear of looking like, uh, like barbarians. Um, so uh, going back to the Going a little deeper into the uh, aspects of the Mexican Revolution, like, for example, during uh, the time when uh, Zapatista was fighting in the south and Pancho Villa was fighting in the north, Villa's troops were very uh, highly associated with war crimes. They were associated with pillaging and barbarism and, and uh, all sorts of terrible things, whereas the, the Zapatista army of the south was not uh, is associated with committing war crimes, stealing from people. Uh, they were when they marched into Mexico City. They went around the town asking for supplies and help and lodging and all of those things. They didn't just uh, take them, and that's how they were able to build popular support. Um, so, looking to different movements that uh, obviously we don't want to be associated with the terrible things like Pancho Villa did, and we want to make sure that if those things are going on, uh, we're documenting that and sharing it with the world because. I think that the federal armies may be more inclined to do those sorts of things, or the UN troops around the world have done things similar of that nature. Um, other secession movements worth, worth noting and uh, kind of understanding and analyzing as they relate to New Hampshire independence, um, Palestine, the, the struggle there has essentially become a secession movement as the state of Israel grows. Um, it didn't really start as one, it started as sort of like an, an indigenous resistance movement, but as the lines have been moved, borders have been moved, people have been displaced, it's essentially become a secession movement. Um, and the warfare is so asymmetrical in terms of it's a David and Goliath situation. Uh, one side has lots of military power, um, lots of technology, the other side does not, the other side has very little. Um, in terms of resources, food, everything, um, territory, outside support. Um, so in that sense, uh, the movement in Palestine has become very much more, yes, there is still uh, physical conflict, but so much more humanitarian uh, and public relations work is being done, and that's a good thing, the way it's changing the, the dialogue about Israel and Palestine, especially here in the United States. Um, and that's a shift that needed to happen because they can't win a war with Israel. They they would just get obliterated just from a technology perspective. Um, so, of course, in an ideal situation here in New Hampshire, we do not have to have war with the United States, and we can hopefully avoid that entirely. Um, but there is the aspect of if, if like, uh, conflict does begin, making sure that one maintains the humanitarian high ground, not engage in, in violence, and especially avoid harming civilians, because I think... Uh, in terms of one, one maintains the moral high ground, harming civilians is the way through which one could be judged. Are they involving third parties that do not want to be involved in a conflict when they shouldn't? Um, and I'd say that's one of the things that, that Palestine, despite their lack of resources, 
if you look to the civilian body count of the uh, Israeli conflict and the Palestinian conflict, Israel, for all its technology, harms so many more civilians than the Palestinians. And it's like, why do these people who have the means to be so much more surgical with their technology harming so many more innocent people? Um, so, uh, yeah, freedom and liberty are, are words that can very easily be empty when they're spoken as propaganda for authoritarian mouthpieces. Um, and even when it is secession movements that are grounded in things that are not libertarian in nature. Um, so that's why I'd say it's important that we put human rights and individual human rights specifically at the forefront of a New Hampshire independence movement. And uh, also that we can use that as a selling point to why we are doing better and are, uh, are politically and uh, human rights respectively why we have superiority over the United States government system that does not respect those travel rights. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd love to see New Hampshire, if for some reason, during our secession movement, the United States establishes borders, that we would openly defy those borders, that we would still invite people to come and trade and travel and uh, not have the restrictions that, that are placed on them elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, that's a pretty much what I had prepared. If anyone has any questions or insight into any of the things I've, I've spoken about, I'd love to get some dialogue going. Are you familiar with um, the Free State of Jones? that happened um, during the Civil War it was a group of former Confederate soldiers who looked at the war as a class warfare. Uh, they were poor, they didn't own slaves, they got sick of what they said was fighting for the rich slave owners and they actually got along with black people that lived near them and they formed their own state and, and there was no racial tension. Um, I would have to I'm not familiar with why it failed, and I believe it was in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, and they were their own country for almost 20 years. And we never taught this in school, but I, again, I'm not... I, are you familiar with that? Yeah, that's a good example of a secession movement within a secession movement, because those are people that seceded from the Confederacy, and uh, they allied themselves with the Union and uh, got resources from the Union. Um, but yeah, that was, I mean, that was great that those people were able to do that. Uh, they, of course, saw lots of conflict and lots of, as, as they, anyone would living in a wartime area, regardless of the situation. But um, that's definitely a great example of, of a way to be a, a better secession movement than the one that's going on around you. You might want also, you can, if you're free to take your, your recorder and you can put it on people's mouth if you want to record, record there. Questions. questions. Yeah. Oh, cool. Or you can just stand close to them and they'll record their questions. You're talking about when? He's got a recorder on him. So. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Uh, so, early on you listed the three conditions. I guess it was the Libertarian Party that said this is these are the three conditions we would like to see on a secession movement. And the third one was that it be no, be toward freedom. Now, okay. Mm -hmm. If there, were, how do you personally agree with that as the conditions? As an example, suppose Utah were to say we want to secede, and the reason we want to secede is we want to build a place where alcohol is just not allowed at all. And if you like that, you live here. If you don't like that, live somewhere else. How would you feel about that? Well, I, I would definitely respect their right to d set whatever rules they want for themselves, and uh, I'd want other people to know that those rules exist so they could either go or not go right. there. Um, but yeah, I'd say in terms of like supporting it, uh, it's it's one thing to support someone's right to do something without like enabling and or financially supporting and uh, that sort of thing, like doing trade with them. So I might not want to support it in the sense of doing trade with them to establish right. this sort of... Uh, prohibitionist utopia, right. but um, it's still important, of course, that they be respected in their right to do that. If you know, as long as they are not forcibly imposing that on other people that equally have as much right to be in that area. In your thinking, uh, say that group was to secede or New Hampshire was to secede, would you want to openly trade with everyone or openly trade with only certain people? That's a good question. Um, I think there's a lot of credit to the idea of like boycotting things that are morally reprehensible, and uh, like for example the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement against Israel. That there are enough uh, either businesses or countries saying that we do not like the behavior of this nation. Until this behavior changes, we will not be giving money to this nation. 
Um, and so I'd say that's a very important right to protect because there was actually American legislation. I forget if there was federal, but I know there was certain state legislation saying that um, if you're going to work for the government, you have to take an oath not to support any boycotts of Israel, which seems to be a, a strange sort of, like, you have to <laughs> swear allegiance to both the U.S. and the Israeli government. <laughs> um, that's, very, so, that's very revealing. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... it's uh, Boycotts are an effective tool and a good way of signaling, like, no, we do not want to and we will not support this activity. Um, I think that is definitely something that needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis in terms of, like, there should be a standard threshold, like if a country is openly committing war crimes, if they're using tactics that are openly harming civilians and they know it's harming civilians, like, these are things you that people would do that you'd not want to do business with them over. So, in the same way, if I knew somebody was openly committing murder, I wouldn't want to be doing business with them. Mm -hmm. I missed the beginning. Uh, do you think you should do certain tactics? Uh, what do you think about violence in general? In your in your ideas. So uh, preemptive violence is definitely always wrong. Like to be the initiator of the violence. Um, and in, I know a lot of times uh, with secession movements they'll talk about states' rights. Well, states have a right to do this to defend themselves. And my, my opinion on that is, well, states do not have rights. People have rights. Individuals have rights. So uh, the idea of a state sort of retaliation is one that, that people should be very uh, cautious about engaging in. And I think that is the heart of the is Israel and Palestine conflict is it stops being about individual actions and it starts being about, well, what did this side do versus that side do? Yeah, it's always that. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, the state power should be hesitant to be engaging in any sorts of actions in its own names in terms of violence. Um, individuals, I think there are times when violence is definitely acceptable. For example, when it's not preemptive violence like during slavery, slavery is an immense form of violence. Engaging in open warfare with slavers, I don't consider that preemptive violence. Now, fortunately, there's not a lot of like outright chattel slavery going on in the U.S. these days. Um, but at a time when that was the case, like, yes, the guerrilla warfare against those slavers was more morally justified than the United States government founding an army and telling people to, against their will, go march and fight that war. And it was happening before the Civil War. There were uh, guerrilla conflicts against the slavers, people going from the North and leading expeditions to free people. Do you think uh, uh, separate New Hampshire would be kind of a refugee camp of sorts? Palestinians or other people. Yeah, I would. Uh, well, the, if you think of it, the Free State Project in and of itself is an immigration movement. They've mostly focused on being a national immigration movement, but it would be great if it was a global immigration movement. And like, it, I think the the idea of like borders and uh, immigration restrictions kind of trip up uh, a desire to get involved in that. But that's, I'd say, all the more reason why we should be involved in pushing those boundaries. I was going to say, Steve's uh, presentation yesterday was excellent, by the way, and he brought up that very same thing, that New Hampshire could be a magnet for anyone, but they need to realize there's no government handouts. You're self-sufficient, or you can get voluntary help from, like, right. say... And we'd be showing what voluntary help is available right. to certain people. Rather than, you know, having taxes that you're forced to pay or you're going to be, you know, locked And then you're also not having to worry about do do I meet specific bureaucratic criterion when you show up. Right, and it could be, it's not just for U.S. citizens, it's, um, you had said it yeah. could be for, you know, any... Yeah. Yeah. Anybody Including from Palestinians, but that's just one example. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's very strange, I think, that there is any such thing as work restrictions in a country. Like, oh, someone wants to work. No, they can't. They're from somewhere else. Like, what? Why is that even a thing? Yeah, it's well, they're not stealing if they're working, by definition. And yeah, and that's what makes it. I feel like the, a lot of the stereotypes against Im uh, immigrants are built up by the government because, like, they'll ban their ability to work and then be like, oh, these, these welfare cheats are out there. Mm with their dirty jobs, off the tax rolls, and it's like, well, that's all you, you left them. And we need to stop them from doing the work that no one else wants to do. <laughs> yep. We have to drive up the cost of that work. Yeah. Yeah, well, that the changes whole, the that. Welfare, the whole federal welfare, which is unconstitutional, but I won't get into that, I think that perpetuates this because there are people that are getting, and I know one family in particular, three generations of them are on welfare. They could be out there working. You know, don't say Americans don't want to work. 
because they're being told not to work if they're being given money not to. And I think that has to, that's part of the, the thing that, the, the conversation that needs to be out there too, is, is that, um, you know, people are self-sufficient. And well, that was one of the concerns of Brexit, is that uh, I guess the British welfare system is very open-ended. Mm -hmm. And so all of these people have concerns about everyone from all over the world is going to sign up for our welfare. And it, I think it seems to be a little uh, unfounded because there, there really isn't a lot of, it's mostly British people that are on welfare. It isn't like they have this massive immigration problem. But um, the, the fact that there was this desire to restrict immigration as their driving force behind Brexit, um, if you think of it, comparing the, the EU to the United States, the EU isn't nearly as oppressive a state as the United States exactly. federal government is. It's more like, if you could think of it, the EU is more like what the U.S. FedGov was supposed to be. They exactly. May, they may have some annoying restrictions. Actually, they have a lot of taxes, though. They have a ton of annoying restrictions, Yeah, they have a lot of taxes. Yeah, they have a lot of petty restrictions, but they're not like a military empire. Right. They're not invading, I, I, they're not blowing things up. Like, they're, they're taxing people and giving them fines, like... So it's a, it's a different kind of... And we'll see if people are allowed to leave it. Yeah, that's no. a good point. They actually do have... Well, Brexit was done under a secession platform that was allowed under their... Yeah, so that'll be interesting because that would help if people can come and go. Yeah. Now, one of the concerns with uh, a lot of secession movements is that, oh, our GDP just went down, our economy just went down. So that's one of those things that, like, there's going to be some bumps, and if people are willing to be like, we want the freedom, it's okay that we're not as productive for the next few years while we... Well, I don't know why that would have to happen. I mean, when when Brexit happened, they didn't want to cut off trade with Europe. In mm -hmm. fact, that was one of the things they kind of threatened. Yeah. But that doesn't make any sense, no. They if didn't we're want willing to, to trade, then no GDP needs to go down. Well, they didn't want to restrict goods. They wanted to restrict people. Yeah. <laughs> they still wanted the goods to flow across the borders. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> All right. Thanks for showing up, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Garrett. Nice. Very good, Garrett. This will make a nice little TED Talk. Yeah. <laughs>